Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a glass of sangria. What do you have, Del? I am drinking a tequila sunrise, and on this week's episode, we will be discussing the crimes of the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, who terrorized California from June 1984 to August 1985. Richard became one of the most infamous serial killers known for his good looks and his blank evil smile and stare. Before we get into his crimes, let's look at the early life of the Night Stalker. Ricardo Munoz Ramirez was born on February 29, 1960 in El Paso, Texas, to Julian and Mercedes Ramirez. He was the youngest of five children and his early life was marked by his father's alcohol habits, which caused his father to have angry outbursts and the physical abuse of Ramirez and his mother and siblings. When Richard was 12, he became enamored with his older cousin, Miguel Ramirez, who was a Green Beret, who also became a rapist and serial killer during his time serving in the Vietnam War. Miguel shared stories of his crimes with the young Richard including Polaroids of the women that he had raped, murdered, and dismembered. Miguel would go on to teach Richard how to kill and stay hidden at night. On May 4, 1973, Richard witnessed Miguel killing his wife, Jessie. Richard later remarked that these violent experiences would fascinate, not traumatize him. Miguel would later be found not guilty by reason of insanity and confined to a state facility. After the shooting, Richard moved in with his sister and her husband. Richard's brother-in-law, Roberto, was a peeping Tom who took Richard on his nightly escapades. In 1977, Miguel was released from the state facility. He would go on to join Richard and Roberto on these escapades. The men bonded over drugs, including LSD and their sexual perversions. This was also around the same time that Richard would get into Satanism and the occult. Richard would land a job at the local Holiday Inn. He used his pass key to steal from the Holiday Inn customers. He also molested two children and attempted to rape a woman. He was beaten by the woman's husband. Although he committed these crimes within the hotel, He was fired, but not prosecuted for them, after the woman refused to testify against him. Richard then dropped out of high school and in 1982 moved and resettled in California. Once in California, he began robbing people to support his new cocaine habit. His murder spree would start two years later. On April 10th, 1984, Richard murdered Mei Luang, a nine-year-old Chinese-American in the basement of his apartment building. Richard lured the girl to the basement. He raped and strangled her before stabbing her to death. This crime was not initially tied to Ramirez and not considered one of the Night Stalker crimes. Mei's murder was only connected to Richard in 2009 through DNA. The first Night Stalker murder occurred on June 28, 1984, when Ramirez murdered Jenny Vincow. Vincow was stabbed repeatedly in her head, neck, and throat in her apartment in Glasgow Park, Los Angeles. This murder demonstrated what would become Ramirez's pattern. He would break into homes, victimize the occupant, and then steal to support his addiction and pay his rent. The next murder was on March 17, 1985. Ramirez attacked Maria Hernandez. He shot at her with a 22 caliber gun. The bullet ricocheted off the keys, saving her life. Hernandez played dead until Ramirez left the scene. Her roommate was not so lucky. Hearing the shot, Dale Okazaki came to the kitchen where she was shot after picking her head up from the counter to see what happened. Within one hour of the home invasion, Ramirez committed a carjacking. He pulled Veronica Yu out of her car and shot her twice. She died at the hospital. On March 27, 1985, Ramirez entered a home that he had burglarized a year earlier and killed the sleeping Vincent Charles Zazara, age 64, with a gunshot to his head from a 22 caliber handgun. 
Zazara's wife, Maxine, was awakened by the gunshot and Ramirez beat her and bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While he ransacked the room, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed, which was not loaded. Ramirez shot her three times with a twenty two caliber, then got a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times, then removed her eyes with the knife and placed them in a jewelry box, which he took when he left and kept at his apartment as a souvenir. The autopsy determined that the mutilations were post-mortem. Vincent and Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. Ramirez left footprints from a pair of Avia sneakers in the flower beds, which the police photographed and cast. This was some of the only evidence that the police had at the time. Bullets found at the scene were matched to those found at previous attacks, and the police determined that a serial killer was operating in the area. On May 14, 1985, Ramirez entered the home of Bill and Lillian Doy. Ramirez shot Bill as he was going for his own gun. After beating Bill, he raped Lillian and then ransacked the home. Bill later died from his injuries in the hospital. On May 29, 1985, Richard bludgeoned sisters Mabel Bell and Nettie Lang. After raping Lang, he used Bell's lipstick to draw satanic symbolism on the walls of the house. Bell died from her injuries in the hospital. The following night, he repeatedly raped Carol, Kyle, and held her and her son at gunpoint looking for their valuables. Ramirez then murdered Mary Cannon in her house by knocking her unconscious with a lamp and then stabbing her to death on July 2, 1985. On July 5, 1985, Ramirez broke into the home of Whitney Bennett. He beat Whitney with a tire iron while she slept in her bed. He tried to strangle her but was startled by the spark that came from the lamp. He would later say he thought it was Jesus saving Whitney. Whitney would survive and required 478 stitches. Two days later, on July 7th, Ramirez beat Joyce Nelson to death by stomping on her face with the Avia shoes, which left an imprint on her face. On the same night, Ramirez burglarized the home of Sophie Dickman. He attempted to rape her. When she told him she swore he had everything, Richard said, quote, swear to Satan, end quote. On July 20th, 1985, Ramirez hacked Leela and Maxim Neatland with a machete while they were sleeping. He then shot them with a 22. He mutilated their bodies before stealing their valuables and leaving the home. At 4.15 a.m. the next day, he shot Shingarong in the head with a 25 caliber handgun, killing him instantly, then repeatedly raped and beat his wife. He bound the couple's eight-year-old son before dragging some kid around the house to reveal the location of any valuable items, which he then stole. During this assault, he demanded that she quote-unquote swear to Satan that she was not hiding any money from him. On August 6th, he broke into the home of Chris and Virginia Peterson. He shot Virginia and then shot Chris in the neck. Ramirez attempted to flee, but a struggle started. Chris managed to prevent himself from being shot again, and Ramirez got away. On August 8th, he broke into the home of Stakinia and Els Avalon. He instantly killed the sleeping Ellis with a shot to the head from a 25 caliber handgun. He handcuffed and beat Sakina while forcing her to reveal the location of the family's jewelry and then brutally raped her. He repeatedly demanded that she swear on Satan that she would not scream during his assault. When the couple's three-year-old son entered the bedroom, Ramirez tied the child up and then continued to rape Sakina. Richard had been following the media's coverage of his crimes. He left L.A. for San Francisco. On August 18, 1985, he entered the home of Peter and Barbara Pan. He shot the sleeping Peter in the temple with a 25 caliber handgun, which killed him instantly. He then beat and sexually assaulted Barbara, aged 62, before shooting her in the head and leaving her for dead. At the crime scene, Richard used lipstick to draw a pentagram and the phrase, quote-unquote, Jack the Knife, on the bedroom wall. Ramirez again left a shoe print 
at the scene that detectives discovered and matched to a specific pair of Avia's shoes that were not common at the time. The lead detectives were able to discover that the make and size 11 and a half were shipped to California and that they were the shoes of the killer. When it was discovered that the ballistics and shoe print evidence from the LA crime scenes matched the pan crime scene, San Francisco's then mayor, Diane Feinstein, divulged this information, including the gun caliber, in a televised press conference. This leak frustrated the detectives in the case as they knew the killer would be following media coverage, which gave him an opportunity to destroy crucial forensic evidence. Ramirez, who had indeed been following the press, dropped his size 11 and a half sneakers over the side of the Golden Gate Bridge that night. He remained in the area for a few more days before heading back to LA. On August 24th, 1985, Ramirez broke into the house of Bill Carnes and his fiance Inez Erickson. Ramirez entered the sleeping couple's bedroom and awakened Carnes when he cocked his 25 caliber handgun. He shot Carnes three times in the head before turning his attention to Erickson. Ramirez told her that he was the night stalker and forced her to swear she loved Satan as he beat her with his fists and bound her with neckties from the closet. After stealing what he could find, Ramirez dragged Erickson to another room before raping her. He then demanded cash and more jewelry and made her quote-unquote swear on Satan there was no more. Before leaving the home, Ramirez told Erickson, quote, tell them the night stalker was here, end quote. Erickson untied herself and went to a neighbor's house to get help for her severely injured fiance. Surgeons removed two of the three bullets from his head and he survived his injuries. Erickson gave a detailed description of the assailant to investigators. On August 29, 1985, law enforcement officials decided to release a mugshot of Ramirez from a 1984 arrest for auto theft to the media, and the Night Stalker finally had a face. At the press conference, it was announced, quote, we know who you are now and soon everyone else will. There will be no place you can hide, end quote. On August 30th, 1985, Ramirez took a bus to Tucson, Arizona to visit his brother, unaware that he had become the lead story in virtually every major newspaper and television news program across California. After failing to meet his brother due to him not being home, Ramirez returned to Los Angeles early on the morning of August 31st. He walked past police officers who were staking out the bus terminal in hopes of catching the killer should he attempt to flee on an outbound bus and into a convenience store in East Los Angeles. After noticing a group of elderly Hispanic women fearfully identifying him as quote-unquote El Matador, literally meaning the killer in Spanish, Ramirez saw his face on the front page of the newspaper La Opinion with a headline calling him in Basar Nocturno, the night invader, and fled the store in a panic. After running across the Santa Ana freeway, he attempted to carjack an unlocked Ford Mustang, but was pulled out by angry resident Faustino Pinong. Ramirez ran across the street and attempted to take car keys from Angelina de la Torre. The woman's husband, Manuel, witnessed the attempt and struck Ramirez over the head with a fence post in the pursuit. A group of over 10 residents formed and chased Ramirez down Hubbard Street in Boyle Heights. The group of citizens forced and held Ramirez down and relentlessly beat him. At around 8 a.m., police were called over a disturbance in the area with few details with indications of a fight. Police quickly arrived at the 3700 block of Hubbard and found that Ramirez was severely beaten, unarmed, and took him into custody. Jury selection for the trial began on July 22, 1988. At his first court appearance, Ramirez raised a hand with a pentagram drawn on it and yelled, quote-unquote, hell Satan. On September 20th, 1989, Ramirez was convicted of all charges, 13 counts of murder, 5 attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. During the penalty phase of the trial, on November 7th, 1989, he was sentenced to death in California's gas chamber. He said to reporters after the sentence, quote, big deal, death always came with the territory. See you in Disneyland. End quote. Ramirez died of complications secondary to B cell lymphoma at Marin General Hospital in Greenbrae, California on June 7, 2013. Jenny, 
What are your thoughts on the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez? It's truly horrifying and what nightmares are made of. You're sleeping in your house and then someone breaks in and kills you, tortures you, and then robs you. It's what else is scarier? I never knew his childhood was so violent and that he had a murderer in his family. It's almost like he was raised to be a killer because of his cousin. And Miguel, his cousin, is without a doubt a monster too. I didn't know that much about Richard Ramirez. I didn't know that he had killed and hurt so many people. It's interesting that so many people were did survive him. And I didn't know how brutally he tortured people as well. Raping women in front of their children is so horrible. And he's very erratic in what he does. There is a pattern, but at the same time, it's so erratic that it's kind of remarkable that the police were able to piece their crimes together. And the story of him getting caught and beaten and chased down by just everyday people is so wild and fascinating to me. I also didn't realize that he didn't die until somewhat recently either. It's all around like very fascinating story and very, very disturbing to learn about. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Richard Ramirez was actually one of the first serial killers as I was getting into true crime that I read about and watched stuff about. So I guess it's about time that we actually talked about him on the podcast, right? But I absolutely agree with you. I think that he was really raised to be a killer. And I think that his background really didn't give him any other option, unfortunately. Not excusing anything that he did, but I think that it paints a picture of sadness that he's not the only one. We've talked about many killers on this podcast and we'll continue to talk about them that had horrific childhoods and then decided that they were going to inflict punishment upon other people. When reading about his cousin, it was so strange about how comfortable this man was of sharing these horrific images. I mean, the fact that he took the pictures in the first place kind of tells you all you need to know about the atmosphere of the Vietnam War and this individual. But the fact that he would then pull his younger cousin, who already had a disturbed background, into it. And then it's also telling that Ramirez was fascinated by it. Typically, when you see such horrific images, it makes you take a pause. It makes you take a step back. But Ramirez already showing what would become his life wanted more. He wanted to see more. And eventually, he wanted to be the one perpetrating that level of cruelty onto other people. I do think it's interesting, his final statements. It always comes up on those lists when you hear about like, here's the strange things that people have said once they've been found guilty or, you know, given this death sentence of like, oh, see you in Disneyland. Like, oh, this is just fun and games. Like, oh, nothing is happening. I'm just, you know, being sentenced to die because I decided to be one of the worst people in the world by deciding to be a serial killer. And I think that his case also illustrates how long it actually takes to put someone to death, especially in California. When he died, he still had appeals that he could exhaust. And just to remind you, he was given the death sentence in 1989. So that was more than 30 years ago. And so I don't support the death penalty, but I also don't think that we should have people sitting for decades on death row while they sort out a bunch of different um, things tied to the case, especially in a case like this where you had really solid evidence. It's like, it's one of those weird things where I would love to ask someone that supports the death penalty, like, why do you support It taking 30, 40 years for it to be carried out. And a lot of these people end up dying from something else. I definitely agree. And that's one of the many faults within the United States justice system, just how long it takes for people to either receive justice or it's for people to, I guess, pay the price for their crime. And yeah, like you said, Del, he wasn't even executed. He died from lymphoma and illness. 
Right, which I think that goes to say, like, you give these guys life in prison, they're going to die in prison. Why do we have to have this extra state execution when you can just let time play out? Especially since a lot of these killers, they get caught when they're fairly older. Um, Richard Ramirez is a rare exception to that, where he was 29 when he got sentenced to death. It doesn't make any sense to me. And while I don't support it, I would definitely be more in favor of Japan style sentence where the trial might take a lot longer. But once the sentence is handed out, it's there. It's done. The family has justice. I think that's just a better way to do it than just leaving someone to agonize on death row. The death penalty is already inhumane for me. And you're just adding another element to it that doesn't need to be there. Like many other serial killers, Richard Ramirez had a fan base dedicated to him despite his horrific crime. This included Doreen Lyoy, who married him in California's San Quentin State Prison on October 3rd, 1996. And according to everything that I saw, they stayed married until his death. And he did have other girlfriends as well, despite being a serial killer, and a married man. So this leads into people that are attracted to people like Richard Ramirez. And this is a paraphilia in which sexual arousal, facilitation, and attainment of orgasm are responsive to and contingent upon being with a partner known for having committed a crime. It is also known as the Bonnie and Clyde syndrome. Several theories have been proposed as to why this phenomenon exists. They include low self-esteem and a lack of a father figure. Some believe that they can change a man as cruel and as powerful as a serial killer. Others see the little boy that the killer once was and seek to nurture him. A few hope to share in the media spotlight or get a book or movie deal. There is also the notion of the quote-unquote perfect boyfriend. She knows where he is at all times, and she knows that he is thinking about her. While she can claim that someone loves her, she does not have to endure the day-to-day issues involved in most relationships. There's no laundry to do, no cooking for him, and no accountability to him. She can keep the fantasy charged up for a long time. Some mental health experts have compared infatuation with killers to extreme forms of fanaticism. They view such women as insecure females who cannot find love in normal ways or as quote-unquote love-avoidant females who seek romantic relationships that cannot be consummated. Jenny, what do you think of hybristophilia, and does any of these theories stand out to you as the most probable? I never knew that there was a name for this, and we've definitely talked about this on the podcast before, but It's very gross and strange to me. I don't want to yuck anybody's yum, but I definitely don't understand this. I didn't know that there were so many theories behind it too. I think it's interesting that the low self-esteem and lack of a father figure is listed because I think that's often a stereotype put on women in certain types of relationships. But I think in this instance, there might be some basis to it. I think a lot of this comes from thinking that you can change someone or that you know the real them, quote unquote, real them. They're not this monster that the public thinks. And that wanting attention, like you had said, Del, attention from the public and the media, even if it is negative, people are attracted to other high profile, powerful people. I guess whether it's positive or negative attention too. I think the idea of the perfect boyfriend though is really interesting. And I think that could probably play into it too. It's kind of this like relationship you have more so in your head and maybe through like letters and the phone than anything else. And maybe that's what some people want. They don't want to have to have all the like 24 seven attention and intimacy and the bad parts of a relationship. I'm sure really the more fun and exciting parts that you're getting from this, the perfect boyfriend theory. What do you think? I'm interested to know. Yeah. So I think that this goes to show you that there is a philia for everything, a paraphilia for everything. And 
we talked about this specifically with Jeffrey Dahmer. And he was one of the examples that was frequently used, in addition to Richard Ramirez and Ted Bundy, when it came to women who will throw themselves at men who are not available, one, and more importantly, killers. Like, this is not small crimes. This is not someone saying that, though, you know what? I don't think that this crime is right, like if it's a drug possession charge or some other ridiculous crime. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about people, this comes up more in women, who find serial killers to be what motivates them in life, what gives them the butterfly. And honestly, when it comes to the theories, I think that it's all dependent on the person. I think that there could be a sense of, I don't want a normal relationship. And so I'm going to enter into this relationship that cannot be normal by design. This person is in jail. And also when it comes to media, of course, there are people that will do anything to be famous, even if that involves tying yourself to a killer to someone who has been proven in a court of law to be the drud of society. But I could get a book deal, but I can get a movie deal. I'm the wife of Richard Ramirez, right? You have this sense that that is what some people are trying to obtain. I do think that it was interesting that they were comparing it to fanaticism. And I can definitely see that because when it comes to When it comes to certain fan communities, you can definitely see how that fandom is the most important thing in their life, sort of like a relationship would be. And I can definitely see how if you are so in love with the idea of something, so in love with all the thoughts that you're able to create without anything contradicting it, like seeing that person on a daily basis, having to navigate relationship troubles with that person, how it could lead to like the perfect boyfriend theory, where it's like, why wouldn't I want to be with someone who I know is going to be faithful to me? But all in all, it's very toxic. I do think that it's something that people should seek help for, because I don't think that it is a part of people's normal existence to not only be attracted to, but be obsessed with serial killers and other people that have committed horrific crimes. It doesn't sound healthy to me. So one of the things that was interesting about this case is the failure of then mayor Diane Feinstein to ensure that critical evidence was not released. As a refresher, now Senator Feinstein told the press and by consequence Ramirez that the police knew the killer wore an 11 and a half of via sneaker and the type of gun Ramirez was using, which connected Ramirez's crimes together. Jenny, do you think politicians have a role to play in active investigations or should they refrain from getting involved? I think it's really case by case. I understand why they would get involved because they want their constituents to be safe. They want to hear them out, what their concerns are, and help serve them. So I think in this case, now Senator Feinstein probably was trying to help the public and let them know like, hey, we're on to something. We know who this guy is. We at least know something about this person, but it really backfired. I think it's okay for them to be involved, but I can definitely see their influence and power playing a negative role in finding the right criminal who committed a crime. Maybe they're trying to speed this through and then the police are going to do a sloppy job. Or I can see them also helping to hide something if they were somehow connected to this suspect or if something could even be connected back to them. We've seen stuff like that happen. So that all can really hinder the investigation. So I would say like tread lightly. I think it's okay to be involved. Like I said, you want to know what's going on and to keep your community safe, but don't get too involved. What do you think? So I don't think that politicians have any role to play in active investigations. 
I think that when it comes to communicating information to the public about active investigation, that should come from the police department. The mayor selects a chief of police, someone whose job it is to know what's going on and to be able to communicate that message to the public. I do think that politicians may be able to help in a general sense of safety when it comes to like large scale attacks to make sure that the country feels safe. But when it comes to specific cases, I don't think that they should be involved. I don't think that information should be necessarily shared with them, especially such specific information as to the size and make of the sneakers that the detectives knew was super critical. But how are you getting that message conveyed to a mayor? Also, when politicians enter anything, it becomes political by nature. And it becomes a thing of how does this help or hurt my political career? I don't think that those questions should ever enter an active investigation. Because like you said, it could hinder it. Something can be hidden. Because you're investigating, you don't know who's involved. And you never know if you're hurting yourself by bringing in outside people. I'm definitely of the belief that the less the public knows about the specific details as you investigate it, the better, except in very select circumstances like kidnappings or other things like that, where you do need the public to know more details because they can be instrumental in finding a missing person. In this case, to show a better way of releasing information and to involve the public is what the police detective eventually ended up doing, which was releasing the mugshot. When I think of a good way to use the press to help an investigation, that's what I think of. But specific information, I just don't know how that's ever a good thing. Releasing the murder weapon details, especially when you don't know who the person is, you never want to give them an opportunity to destroy evidence because that could be basically determining whether you're going to be able to prove that this person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. In this case, it was very clear that Richard Ramirez was a night stalker. I don't think that anyone can present a theory to the contrary. But we've discussed other cases where it wasn't so clear, where it wasn't so black and white, where had there been better police work, better communications to the public, it would have been solved. So I agree, it's a tricky situation, but all in all, I think that we should keep police investigations and politics away from each other because them coming together just doesn't seem to be a good mix. I would agree that in general, the less the public knows, the better. And you're so right about if the media wants to get involved, then the mugshot when they knew it was him was the best way to do it. I guess obviously this is a glaring example of when it went wrong. But I also couldn't find many examples of the opposite where a politician specifically got involved and it helped the case. So that's the other side of the coin as well. Like, are they doing this for their own personal gain in their career or are they truly doing it for the public? To me, it's too muddy of waters. So I would just keep them separate. Yeah, that's a great point. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with an episode focused on crimes that inspired horror movies. As always, stay safe.